My name is uh, Hideki Hamamoto, Vice Chairman of the U.S.-Japan Council, and we'll now begin Session 3. In this security-related session, we want to commemorate and focus on the 50th year of the U.S.-Japan Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security. This treaty epitomizes the best in U.S.-Japan relations and collaboration and is a testament to the strength and durability of the alliance. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out that this alliance is not only for mutual security, but also to provide humanitarian support and disaster relief. We believe that in today's environment, this alliance is a much needed stabilizing cornerstone, not only for U.S.-Japan relations, but also for the Asia Pacific region. You have just heard about potential economic and business opportunities but as I speak, there are real concerns and challenges to assure a stable environment in the region. So the road ahead in the Asia Pacific has great opportunities, but also has its share of challenges and real concerns. At this time, it is my privilege to introduce our first speaker for this session. As you all know, Admiral Willard, is the commander of the Pacific Command here in Hawaii, whose mission, in fact, includes the preserving of security, stability, and freedom upon which enduring prosperity in the Asia Pacific depends. The Admiral's distinguished career is in your program, but let me highlight a few points not in the program. A mutual friend and fellow Naval officer said to me, there is no other officer that is more knowledgeable about Japan and the Asia Pacific, with his commands in and around Japan and his pension for assimilating his environment, he is virtually a walking encyclopedia on the region. Finally, Hawaii's own and great Senator Tinoi asked that I convey the following to you, Admiral. He says, I have worked with many fine officers as commander of the Pacific Command and Admiral Willard is one of the greatest. The Senator also deeply regrets that the Senate duties have prevented him from attending today to introduce you personally as originally planned. Admiral, thank you for all you do for our country. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Willard. That was very kind. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was enjoying, actually, learning a little about uh, APEC and the leaders uh, meeting here in Honolulu. Uh, Pacific Command will be uh, working very closely with uh, the uh, local police and, and uh, other security uh, agencies to provide protection for all of those leaders. So um, it's of great interest to us, and, and uh, as I think everyone that uh, lives in Japan is we're all, or lives in Hawaii is we're all very proud that APEC is coming here. Uh, thank you again for the kind introduction, Admiral Fargo, Ambassador Schieffer, Consul General Kamo, Consul General Bins, Governor Yuzaki, Governor Ariyoshi, uh, distinguished guests from the United States and from Japan. Good morning and Ohio gozaimasu. Uh, it's a great honor to have this opportunity to remark on one of the most consequential alliances in modern times, particularly as we celebrate its 50th anniversary. Uh, this is personal as well. Having lived in Japan twice, visited many times, uh, I continue as PACOM to work closely with Chief of Defense General Ariki and his joint staff on a regular basis I have a great respect for the nation of Japan and its people and for the special relationship that our two nations and militaries uh, so much enjoy. Anytime one ally is hosted on the soil of another, both, both sides must remain fully committed to managing the never-ending complexities that accompany that relationship. For half a century, Japan and the United States have worked diligently to ensure that forward U.S. forces have the support, the training, and the freedom of action that they've needed
to contribute to the security of the region and defense of Japan in a manner that serves both nations' interests and both nations' prosperities. At the same time, the Japan Self-Defense Forces have advanced their own capabilities to the extent that they're not only ideal partners with their U.S. counterparts, but they're influential throughout the Asia Pacific and contributing to international efforts such as counter-terror, counter-piracy, peacekeeping, and disaster response. As we speak, the forward naval, ground, and air forces from the United States are conducting one of the largest annual training exercises with the Japan Self-Defense Force. And as has become routine, even the Korean military has been invited to observe. Last May in Tokyo, Secretary Clinton remarked, we can be very proud of all we've accomplished together, the peace we've kept, the prosperity we've built, and the bonds we've forged. This partnership is essential for meeting the challenges not only of today, but also of tomorrow. And, it's, and it is a rock solid foundation for our shared futures. The idea that the defense relationship between Japan and the United States continues to evolve isn't trivial. Though forged at the start of the Cold War, today the United States-Japan alliance endures as one of the most significant and relevant in the world and remains an example of how, to any, who doubt what's achievable when nations work together to advance their common interests and their common values. The willingness of both allies to adapt the relationship to the ever-changing security environment in the Asia-Pacific has maintained its relevance. The realignment initiative involving Marine Forces on Okinawa that's ongoing now has received much attention for the debates that it's generated as both nations attempt to manage the details of its execution. In my view, it's an example of the willingness of Japan and the United States to deal with the toughest aspects between the host nation and foreign forces to continually optimize a laydown that meets both our security needs and minimizes the burden on local host communities. Such efforts aren't new. We've adjusted the U.S. force structure in Japan many times in the last 50 years, and we should applaud this work and never criticize it. To praise the achievements of this alliance, we need only consider what our militaries are doing together in the region and how far we've come as nations, particularly given our World War II history. This year, we deployed together alongside other foreign militaries and non-government organizations to conduct medical, dental, engineering, and veterinary humanitarian assistance in Southeast Asia and Oceania. We're both contributing to improving conditions in Afghanistan in order to achieve greater stability in South Asia and deny havens for extremist groups such as Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and Lashkar-e-Taiba. We're both part of a coalition endeavoring to eliminate piracy in the Gulf of Aden. Some weeks ago, we exercised together with Korea to counter proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And last month, the Japanese defense ship Kirishima destroyed a ballistic missile target that was fired from our Pacific Missile Test Facility in Kauai. The intercept occurred 100 miles over the Pacific at 8,000 miles per hour, and it was the 21st time a U.S. or Japanese ship has successfully demonstrated this capability. The event marks the pinnacle of growing defense cooperation between Japan and the United States on technology development and combined systems employment, Rele relevant to protect Japan from the likes of North Korea and its advancing ballistic missile and nuclear weapon capabilities. While we can't take our alliance for granted and must remain committed to adopting, adapting it to an Asia-Pacific security environment that's ever-changing, I'm optimistic that both Japan and the United States recognize how profoundly this alliance contributes to regional security and ensuring the prosperity of both of our nations. For the past 65 years, we've helped to create an environment in which the Asia-Pacific region has advanced to become the economic heart of the world. 
and Japan and the United States, two of the world's richest nations. Who could have imagined that the United States and Japan, once formidable enemies, could grow together to become the alliance of consequence in the 21st century? As we look to the future of new competing powers, nuclear armed rogue nations, territorial disputes, expanding transnational threats, competition for resources, and more frequent man-made and natural disasters. We have to determine how this alliance serves to keep Japan and America safe and prosperous. General Ariki and I meet for a third round of strategic discussions in January for the purpose of evolving our plans for the defense of Japan. Japan, Korea, and the United States will meet this Monday to discuss how we might work together to reduce the threat that North Korea is again posing in the region. And together with 24 regional chiefs of defense, General Ariki and I discussed maritime security in the South and East China Seas in an effort to come to terms with the challenges such as Japan recently faced in the Senkakus. There's no lack of work where Asia-Pacific security is concerned. And while we understand that defense relationships and military approaches alone can't solve all of the region's challenges, they remain the underpinning of the dialogues and initiatives in which both Japan and the United States, together with other partners and allies, engage. On behalf of the United States military, I'd like to thank you who in your spare time with organizations like the U.S.-Japan Council and the Japan-America Society of Hawaii foster the personal relationships that are vital to maintain our profound national bonds. And leaders like you who fully appreciate the value of today's United States-Japan alliance, who continue to share your perspectives and influence in ways that enable the work that both nations are accomplishing. Again, thank you for what you do and for today's opportunity to applaud this great ally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral Willard, for such a strong endorsement of the importance of this relationship. And uh, I think it's us also that uh, need to thank you and the men and women of this uh, wonderful military that you lead that provides us uh, the kinds of freedoms that we enjoy. Well, again, my name is uh, Ed Hawkins. I'm the president of the Japan America Society of Hawaii, and uh, we're so delighted to host, uh, co-host this symposium along with the uh, U.S.-Japan Council. It's just a wonderful, world-class organization, and I want to thank uh, Irene Hirano Inoue and Hideki Hamamoto and, and the uh, U.S.-Japan Council, the rest of the council, many of you that are in the audience today. Um, before I introduce the panel members, I, I would like to recognize a couple of people, several people that are here from Japan, not just the panelists, but uh, in the audience. Uh, they came all the way from Japan, from Tokyo, to uh, participate, about uh, six people. Uh, one is... Um, from um, the America Japan Society in um, uh, Tokyo, and that's uh, Executive Director Mr. Takashi Watanabe, and the Executive Director of the uh, America Japan Society of Tokyo Tama, Mr. Shoichi Suzuki, who is our. They happen to be our sister society, so uh, I just wanted to recognize them. Thank you for coming all this way for this symposium. Um, I'm going to take just a little bit longer than Sharon Weiner did in introducing the panel. Um, I want to set up the, uh, uh, the background a little bit and the kinds of expertise that we have on the panel. Uh, but Sharon, you, you did a great job. <laughs> i got to say that because she's the incoming chair. Um, but uh, the... Um, the panel on security will be uh, moderated by retiree Admiral Thomas Fargo, former commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet, as well as former commander of U.S. Pacific Command. Admiral Fargo led these commands during the crucial transition from the Cold War to the war on terrorism. So he has an extensive experience and knowledge 
of the security environment in the region. A graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Admiral Fargo began his career in nuclear submarines. Joining the panel on security will be both Japanese and American experts. Mr. Kazuyoshi Urimoto, representing Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or MOFA, uh, he's the Director General of the North American Affairs Bureau. Mr. Urimoto brings us 30 years of experience in Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Northeast Asia. He holds a mathematical science degree from the University of Tokyo. Mr. Kiyoshi Serizawa, representing Japan's Ministry of Defense as Director, Equipment Policy Division. Mr. Serizawa has experience in both MOFA and the Ministry of Defense in areas such as arms control, disarmament, and defense policy. Mr. Serizawa holds a law degree from Tokyo University. And Mr. Daniel Pekuda, representing the U.S. State and Defense Departments as Foreign Policy Advisor to the Commander, U.S. Pacific Command. Mr. Pekuda's experience in the theater, including duties as Charge d'Affaires, Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, will bring a crucial perspective to this panel. Mr. Pekuda holds a law degree from the University of Southern California. So we have a nuclear submariner, two lawyers, and a mathematician, so we should have a great panel. <laughs> so I'd like to call up the panel members. And just to remind, we will have uh, questions and answers, and you should have the uh, papers to write down your uh, questions and answers and bring them up at the end. Okay, so I'll turn it over to you, Admiral Fargo. Well, thank you, Ed, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity and the honor to moderate this panel here this morning. Um, in accordance with your guidance, I'll make some very brief introductory remarks just to kind of put this in, in perspective or context with you. Admiral Willard uh, mentioned that this relationship uh, is not just a security relationship, it's not just a military relationship, but has evolved to a personal relationship, and I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, my first experience in Japan started in 1963 when my father, who was also a naval officer, was ordered to Sasebo, Japan, for, for duty. And I did the math last night, and 1963 doesn't take us all the way back to 50 years, but it's pretty close. <laughs> Now, those of you who remember the early days, uh, we were using military script because the relationship hadn't developed to the degree of trust that we have today. And I think it was 360 yen to a dollar, Governor, if I have that, <laughs> I have that correctly. But of course, today, as Admiral Willard said, it's evolved to the point where we share our very best technology and we do research and development that has produced the kind of missile defense that is going to protect this alliance in the days ahead. It was clear to me back in 1963 uh, that this was a very special relationship. I watched my parents in that day and age host their Japanese counterparts in our home, and of course that hospitality was reciprocated. And I used to wonder why my mother, when we came back to the United States, won all these awards for flower arranging. And that was clearly because Ikebana uh, was a big part of her life. It wasn't long before I made my first deployment in 1972 as a young naval officer and there have been countless visits since then. As Admiral Willard said, we've all lived in Japan and I certainly did from 1993 to 1994. This alliance has endured the Vietnam War, the Cold War, the War on Terror and countless incidents, crises, and of course the political ups and downs that all of our nations have. So it is, it has very, very clearly stood the test of time. And I was having dinner the night that your diet, uh, the diet in Japan, approved the deployment of the Japanese ships to the North Arabian Sea with, with Admiral Toru Ishikawa. And that marked another strategic turning point in this relationship. So let me, uh, let me conclude by saying 
I spent uh, four days last week uh, in China, uh, China, a place that, uh, of course, we'll discuss in some depth, I assume, today. Uh, and I had wide access to the military, the foreign ministry, uh, the think tanks, as well as their universities. Uh, but before I left, I went to Washington and paid a call on Ambassador Fujisaki. And, of course, uh, I did that uh, because that's what good friends do, uh, because this is our most important relationship. So with that said, uh, let me introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, we're doing this in, in an order where we're going to go Japan, the United States, Japan, and cover all of these particular uh, issues that I'm sure are important to you. Uh, Mr. Umamoto, you've seen his program. Ed's already introduced him, but let me make a point that the job he holds as the North American Affairs Division is absolutely critical to this relationship. He's the first person that I saw when I go to Japan that Admiral Willard sees. Uh, he is the counterpart to our Assistant Secretary of State, uh, and his experience uh, and talent is hugely important uh, to moving forward with this important alliance. Mr. Momoto. Thank you, Admiral, for very kind words. <clears throat> Um, I'm not very good at speaking in front of a huge audience, and uh, I have uh, always a second thoughts, third thoughts, and fourth thoughts, so my draft is always messy. But uh, I, I try my best. Well, um, it's a great pleasure to be in front of such a distinguished audience, and I feel a little bit daunted to talk about uh, this very important alliance in front of so many uh, distinguished guests. Um, the biggest challenge to speak about uh, the Alliance in front of uh, uh, many friends is that may maybe uh, you might expect some difference of opinions among panelists, but uh, maybe what I'm going to say and what my fellow panelists are going to say will be almost exactly the same. <laughs> because everybody agrees this strategic alliance between Japan and the U.S., which had stood the time, uh, test of time, is crucially important for the coming uh, century as well. When we have a sort of a, a try to have a bird's eye view um, and talk about the history, Japan uh, has concluded three alliance relationships. The first one with the British. Anglo-Japanese Alliance of 1902, which facilitated Japan's uh, victory over Russia in japan russo War. And then we had a tripartite alliance with Germany and Italy, which led to a disastrous uh, consequence. And then we have more than 50 years of very successful alliance with the United States. The one sort of a distinguishing element of this alliance is that we've never resorted to the actual use of force. This alliance has been very successful in, um, in deterring potential adversaries to make any armed attack or even armed coercion or uh, threatening, that kind of thing. So we are very pleased that uh, the, the 50 years of very successful alliance has led to a very stable peace and also uh, has provided a basis for prosperity, not only of Japan, but also our neighboring regions, as well as Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific. So in that sense, we are very proud to take part in the maintenance of this very, very important and successful alliance. Some people have said, maybe critically, that to have a presence of foreign troops, foreign military forces, uh, is a sort of an anomalous situation. So we cannot. Uh, continue that kind of thing, and we have to make change and that kind of thing. 
maybe, yes. Uh, to have a huge foreign military presence on our soil is uh, historically something quite new. But perhaps the unprecedented peace and prosperity that we have achieved after the post-World War II is because of an innovation of having U.S. military presence both in East Asia and Europe together with an international economic system based upon Bretton Woods institutions and liberalized uh, trade, open multilateral trade system, which these things are the foundations of the post-World War II uh, peace and stability and peace and prosperity. And Japan-US alliance has been a very, very important building block of this global uh, system. Of course, uh, the, the alliance started as a sort of a mechanism to um, deter uh, the potential communist uh, aggression against us. But uh, the Cold War ended. And uh, we can say that we won the Cold War without shooting any bullet. And then we had uh, uh, made a lot of efforts to make sure that the alliance is also relevant in the post-World War, uh, post-Cold War era. So we did a lot of work in the 90s so that we can have a new rationale, new definition of the alliance. And now, looking at the security environment around Japan, look at Korean Peninsula. Well, of course, uh, the alliance has managed to maintain peace, although from time to time uh, we, uh, we, we've seen uh, provocative acts terrorist acts and that kind of thing from North Korea. But basically, uh, somehow, uh, the peace on the, uh, on the Korean Peninsula has been maintained. And as a result, we now see a vibrant economy, dynamic economy of North uh, Republic of Korea. And Republic Korea is a mature uh, democracy. And it's among the G20s. And uh, we are now in the process of overcoming a historic uh, difficulty uh, between Japan and Korea. So we are now uh, beginning to talking about uh, uh, trilateral uh, partnership among Japan, U.S., Republic of Korea. As Admiral mentioned, we are going to have a trilateral foreign ministers meeting in Washington next Monday uh, to talk about uh, how we can... Uh, maintain uh, stability on the Korean Peninsula in view of uh, the um, very um, unstable um, transition period of North Korea and so on. Cross-channel relationship between Beijing and Taiwan. Of course, uh, the problem is still there, and that's a potentially a dangerous sort of a point. But this also, uh, in, in the past 50 or 60 years, uh, somehow uh, we have maintained peace. Of course, when we look at the, uh, the balance of power, maybe because of the consistent buildup of uh, military capabilities by China, uh, the military balance may be shifting uh, not in our favor, but still, um, I, I think a lot of efforts have been made to ensure the peace. And of course, China. People, everybody is now talking about China. But when we look back upon our policy, um, in late 70s and 80s, Japan provided a huge economic assistance to China because we wanted to help China adopt open and reformist policy. We also uh, made a lot of efforts to 
so that China can participate in WTO system. And in that sense, we, are, uh, we can say that we have been very successful. China is now a huge economic power. China is a trading partner, not only to Japan, but with US and all other nations. So one cannot think of a global economy without China. But of course, the consecutive uh, double-digit uh, defense uh, spending increase has resulted in uh, formidable uh, military capabilities on the part of China. We don't want to go back to the Cold War kind of situation because that is impossible and that is not desirable because we want to maintain good relations with China and that, is, that will be in everybody's national interest and that will be in the interest of China. So in that sense, what we would like to make sure is the Japan-US alliance is the cornerstone and linchpin of the framework which would uh, ensure um, the environment where China feels its national interest to abide by the international rule and behave in accordance with uh, international norm so that we can avoid a repetition of the situation that we, we, we used to have vis-a-vis uh, -vis Soviet Union. We are now enjoying a robust relationship with other regional partners, Australia, Southeast Asians, and so on. And we hope that Japan-US Security Alliance is not limited to bilateral uh, cooperation, but instead the Japan-US relationship would provide a good platform upon which we can develop multilateral or some trade people say minilateral um, um, defense and security relationship with regional partners. Let me, um, so uh, we have a bright future, but we cannot be complacent. Both Japan and US are suffering from uh, economic difficulties. Let's face it. And uh, we have to do many things with our shrinking budget. So how can we do that? Only close cooperation and thinking about the most effective and efficient division of labor, working relationship, will be uh, the only way to uh, go forward. As Prime Minister Khan and President Obama agreed in the last meeting in Yokohama, we would like to develop and deepen our alliance along the three pillars. Of course, the one is security. Security always is at the core of the alliance. That's without saying. But also, what we would like to do is to not dilute the uh, security uh, aspect, but, uh, but complement the security um, aspect of the alliance by having a very, very good economic relations. Of course, economic is not the realm of government. I mean, uh, it's basically the government's role is to provide uh, a framework, an environment where entrepreneurs or companies can uh, play a very important role. But of course, the government can work on clean energy, infrastructure, and that kind of thing, so that uh, the both nations can uh, lead to 21st century uh, world. I won't go into the details of uh, uh, economics, but also I would like to touch upon the third pillar, which is human exchanges, human, cultural, and intellectual exchanges. 
um, I, uh, to my regret, uh, this is the area that we have not been paying, we means Japanese maybe, uh, have not been paying uh, sufficient attention. We've seen the decrease of number of Japanese students at U.S. universities or elsewhere. We've been cutting budgets for intellectual exchanges and so on. So, but now there is a growing consensus among the senior leadership of the government and political parties that we have to do something about it. Because in the ultimate analysis, of course, uh, the uh, alliance relationship is, is, is basically government to government, nation to nation, but all these things will boil down to the relationship between human beings, people to people. There is no abstract Japan-US relationship. It's, it, it's, a, uh, it's a sort of an aggregate of individual friendships and individual uh, mutual trust and respect. And this is the area that we would like to sp uh, spend some energy and time, perhaps before uh, Prime Minister visit United States next spring. So on top of the efforts to make sure that our security alliance is uh, up to the time, and also our economic relationships are uh, more robust and active, but we have to make sure that this human exchange factor, intellectual exchange factor, is also uh, goes hand in hand with other areas as well, because this is the area that uh, uh, which supports everything that we do. And just a brief word about uh, um, uh, roadmap. And uh, as Admiral Willard uh, pointed out, um, there are uh, many issues involved. And these are quite sometimes mundane and or down-to-earth problems. And, and how to strike a balance between um, the bigger picture, huge perspective, because we never should lose sight of the bigger perspective of why we have an alliance, what kind of strategic objectives we would like to pursue uh, uh, based upon the alliance, because alliance or the military relationship is not an end itself, but it's a sort of a tool to achieve something uh, that two nations want to achieve. But on the other hand, we have to make sure that the basis of everything is in a healthy condition. So in that sense, um, uh, there will be ups and downs, and the path forward is not uh, uh, particularly smooth and, and maybe a bumpy. But by close coordination and close consultation, we have to uh, persevere and we have to patiently uh, take pains to address all these issues. And they will never go away, but we have to do that. And uh, Prime Minister Khan and the senior leadership of the government is determined to go ahead on the basis of the agreement that we have in, in this May. So, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dan Picotta, who's the foreign policy advisor to Admiral Willard. Uh, you might ask yourself, why does a military command need a foreign policy advisor? Well, uh, obviously the, the security policy of the United States has to be very closely coordinated between the State Department and the Department of Defense. And with some 43 countries in this particular area of responsibility, uh, much of, of that burden uh, goes to this man that's about to talk to you to make sure that our policy is well coordinated, uh, we manage crisis effectively as we coordinate with uh, the ambassadors throughout the region, and we promote engagement in a manner that's uh, efficient and, and meets our foreign policy goals. Dan? Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral Fargo. Chairman Hirono, Mr. Ambassador, Governor, uh, <clears throat> DG Umamoto, 
and Mr. Sarazawa, Consuls General. I, I want to first thank D.G. Momoto for his role in making Secretary of State Clinton's visit to Hawaii a few weeks ago such a great success. And I'd also like to acknowledge two uh, distinguished <coughs> members of the U.S. military here, Lieutenant General Thiessen, who commands our U.S. Marines in the Pacific Theater, and Major General Alice, who works with us on the Pacific Command staff. Admiral Willard, you know you do a whole lot more of the work that Admiral Fargo described than I do. And although I may sometimes be occasionally entertaining, Admiral Willard will tell you that I am no encyclopedia. I'll begin with a personal note that uh, the admirals have uh, alluded to. My own father served in uh, Japan some decades ago. My wife was born in Kamakura, and we were married in Tokyo. And although my personal experience, professional experience, is much more tied to China, I do have an emotional attachment to Japan. And today, as we celebrate and discuss this uh, U.S.-Japan Security Alliance, I, I think it's appropriate for me to highlight the fundamental role of the U.S. military in Japan. And specifically, I'd like to talk about the reasons that our presence there remains as critical today as it was five decades ago. Uh, D.G. Yumamoto said that some of the themes we're going to cover today will be similar, and that's true. I think it's particularly important that I, as a civilian, talk about our U.S. military forces. As we all know, the basis for our presence can be found in Articles 5 and 6 of the Security Treaty. And according to Article 5 of that treaty, Japan and the United States share an obligation to meet the common danger in the event of an attack on either party in the territories under Japanese administration. And Article 6 highlights our separate responsibilities, that is, for the U.S. to provide for peace and security, and for Japan to provide the areas and facilities necessary to do so. Japan's self-defense force operations, of course, also remain constitutionally constrained. The current configuration of our forces in Japan reflects an evolution of the security context for the alliance that's been earlier described. In the first few decades, the alliance functioned as a Cold War bul bulwark against the Soviet threat in Northeast Asia. In the period following the Cold War, the security context for the alliance shifted with the emergence of new challenges in the region, including North Korea's provocative posture and diplomatic brinksmanship. The Taiwan Straits crisis of 1995, meanwhile, raised questions about the direction of China's defense policy in the context of that country's rapid economic rise. A security environment that once focused northward quickly became colored by developments to the west and south. This past decade has likewise been an extraordinarily dynamic and challenging time, both in the region and globally, as the United States has been engaged in conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Security conditions in East Asia have become more challenging. Despite deteriorating conventional capabilities, North Korea continues to threaten its neighbors. And as we saw this past week with the launching of artillery killing four South Koreans, you've seen all the uh, news reports about North Korea's uranium enrichment activities. North Korea continues to develop its medium and long-range missile systems, its missile and nuclear tests, as well as the sinking of the Chonan, are a further catalog of Pyongyang's capacity for provocation. An uncertain leadership transition is underway, and with that, the possibility of instability. As DG Umamoto alluded, another focus of concern in the region is China's military modernization, encompassing air, sea, missile, and surveillance capabilities. The transparency of that effort, despite some progress, remains limited. As part of its planning for a Taiwan contingency, China continues to develop measures to deter or counter third-party intervention, including by the United States, in a cross-strait crisis. In this effort, 
China is developing anti-access and area denial capabilities to attack at long ranges military forces that might deploy in the Western Pacific. China's pursuing a variety of air, sea, undersea, space, and information warfare and operational concepts to achieve these capabilities. China's force structure improvements, for example, will provide the PLA with systems that can en engage adversary surface ships up to a thousand nautical miles from the PRC coast. And China's investments in advanced electronic warfare systems, counter space weapons, and computer network operations reflect the goal of establishing an array of overlapping, multi-layered, offensive capabilities extending from China's coast into the Western Pacific. China's military ramp up has been matched by recent aggressiveness in the region. Last spring, a PLA Navy flotilla passed through waters near Miyako Island, a demonstration of China's progress to develop blue water naval capabilities. And of course, the recent fishing vessel incident off the Senkaku Islands has magnified regional concerns about this Chinese aggressiveness. Following that incident, Secretary of State Clinton, Secretary of Defense Gates, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mullen, all publicly asserted the United States' intent to stand with our ally, Japan. And I think it's safe to assume that, Japanese, that the Japanese Coast Guard will more frequently encounter vessels in the service of the Chinese Fisheries Law Enforcement Command. Our alliance is also served by expanding trilateral relationships with the Republic of Korea and Australia. The defense trilateral talks with South Korea and the Security and Defense Cooperation Forum with Australia have become important venues for Japan and the United States to work with these regional partners on issues like information sharing, humanitarian assistance and disaster response, and naval search and rescue operations. DG Yamamoto and Admiral Willard, Willard both described the meeting that will occur on Monday when Secretary Clinton South Korean Foreign Minister Kim and Japanese Foreign Minister Mahara will hold a trilateral ministerial in Washington, D.C., where they will discuss the recent developments on the Korean Peninsula and their impact on regional security, as well as other regional and global issues. The special significance of that meeting demonstrates to all those in the region the extraordinarily close coordination between the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan, as well as our commitment to security and stability in the region. U.S. air, naval, and ground forces based in Japan, side by side with Japanese counterparts, have worked together to deter conflict and aggression, to share information and intelligence about regional threats and challenges, and to promote our shared values by responding to humanitarian emergencies in the region and abroad. And I think that broad recognition of the value of our presence is reflected in Japanese public support rates for the alliance that are consistently very high. The current mix of U.S. forces in Japan is based on our military assessment of the capabilities we need in order to meet the obligations we have assumed in the security treaty to defend Japan and maintain peace and security in the region. The U.S. Air Force, for example, deploys top-line aircraft for air superiority, counter-strike, and intelligence collection. The forward presence of our naval forces in Yokosuka and Sasebo enables us to react in a matter of days rather than weeks to regional emergencies. Our naval forces also work on a daily basis with their Japanese counterparts to track the growing foreign submarine presence in areas around Japan. Our Army provides logistical support for a major conflict in the area, as well as integrating with Navy and Air Force elements to provide ballistic missile defense of strategic assets in Japan. The role of the U.S. Marine Corps is perhaps the least understood by the general public. So for me, forgive me for being a little bit technical on this subject, but in reality, it's one of our most critical assets. The 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force, or 3MEF, in Okinawa 
brings together the core capabilities of all the other services into a rapidly deployable, self-contained fighting force known as a Marine Air Ground Task Force. The Marines combine air, ground, and logistical forces together so that in a contingency, there is no need to wait. No need to wait for complicated logistical and airlift support from other services. The short-range helicopters assigned to 3MEF can rapidly move our ground combat and support units on Okinawa across the island chain that links North, East, and Southeast Asia to wherever they are required. For heavier or longer range operations, the Marines are supported by Amphibious Squadron 11 in Sasebo, just a few days sailing time away, and which can project Marine ground and air power anywhere in the region. The Marines embody a unique capability, a unique capability to project power from the sea a key asset in a region like East Asia. Time, distance, and proximity count when the security of a nation is at stake. A base that is located near operating areas can deploy hard power more quickly and effectively. At present, the next closest significant US ground troops are Army contingents based here in Hawaii. And the distance they would have to travel would delay US responses in regional contingencies. East of Hawaii, the next closest ground contingents are in Washington State and California. To put it another way, from Okinawa Prefecture, it takes just 36 hours by sea to get to either mainland Japan or to Korea, three days to the South China Sea, and just five days to the Straits of Malacca. The same voyage from California would take three weeks. It's not unreasonable to believe that some regional actors might feel emboldened to behave even more aggressively if U.S. troops were a lot farther away. The combat capability of the U.S. Marines is also a valuable psychological deterrent, sending a strong signal that an attack on Japan's mainland, Okinawa, or the Senkakus, will immediately involve the United States. This tripwire effect means that the presence of the Marines has significant implications for regional security. Through our U.S. presence in Japan, we are better able to monitor and assess regional concerns. By working together, both our countries understand more about the North Korean weapons of mass destruction and missile capabilities. We understand more about the modernization of the PLA and about the increasingly assertive movements of the PLA Navy. U.S. and Japanese ships, for example, together monitored North Korean missile launches in 2006 and 2008, and our ships continue to monitor Chinese naval activity near Japan's outlying islands. In addition to security challenges, the East Asia Pacific region has suffered from natural disasters, natural disasters that have tested the international community's ability to respond. Through our forward U.S. presence in Japan, we are better able to respond to humanitarian disasters in the region and around the world. The 2004 tsunami, Typhoon Nargis in 2008, and disasters in Samoa, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Taiwan were significant in terms of scale and the difficulty of delivering aid to those in need. Our forces worked together to deliver aid to flood-ravaged flood areas in Pakistan and to remote earthquake-stricken regions in Indonesia. Earlier, while I was in Beijing, and with Chinese diplomatic assistance, U.S. aircraft based in Japan helped to deliver assistance to typhoon victims in Burma. The United States welcomes Japan's participation and leadership in multilateral disaster response activities. Examples are Japan's participation in the 2009 ASEAN Regional Forum Voluntary Demonstration of Response in the Philippines and Japan will co-host the ARF disaster relief exercise in Indonesia next March. These sorts of missions are both the right thing to do and very much in our shared interest, as they project a positive image to the region about the role of the U.S.-Japan alliance. The pattern of cooperation now extends even beyond East Asia. Japanese self-defense forces personnel, for example, transited Miami in January on their way to Haiti to provide medical assistance to earthquake victims. But when we strip away all the other very important cooperative efforts, the bedrock of the alliance is quite basic. 
Our treaty commitment to Japan means that whenever a soldier, marine, sailor, or airman swears an oath to support and defend our Constitution of the United States, that person takes an obligation to defend Japan if it is ever attacked. A word of caution. If we were to build further on this alliance only on mutually perceived threats, our alliance would only be as strong and, in, and as enduring as the potential threats we face. We must keep in the forefront of our actions and our rhetoric the shared values that underpin this U.S.-Japan alliance. We are, in other words, stronger together than we would be separately. And that strength derives in some large measure from the presence of the U.S. forces in Japan and from the synergies that derive from our ability to work together. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Kiyoshi Shirazawa. Uh, Mr. Shirazawa is from the Japan Ministry of Defense, and I, I would only point out that it wasn't too long ago when Japan didn't have a Ministry of Defense. Uh, this is a, a relatively new uh, cabinet-level post that uh, has succeeded the Japan Defense Agency, and I think it happened in the Koizumi administration, if I have it right, Mr. Ambassador. Shirazawa-san. Okay. Thank you very much for the admiral for the inter introduction. The, it is great honor for me to be here and to speak the, in front of all distinguished guests and uh, experts. Um, I'm from the Ministry of Defense, so uh, uh, today I'd like to uh, talk the, the, this topic from mainly the security, defense, military perspectives. But uh, the please understand that my presentation is not necessary represent the, my government of show the views. It's my, my personal views. There is no question Japan-U.S. alliance has played a pivotal role in maintaining, maintaining the peace and stability in Asia-Pacific region in the past 50 years. During Cold War era, it was uh, the firm basis of deterrence in Northeast Asia to the uh, U.S.-Korea alliance. Some distinguished experts said that uh, Japan-U.S. defense cooperation in 1980s was uh, a hidden success story to contribute to ending the Cold War in a peaceful manner. When the Cold War was over, we, we, we confirmed the significance of the alliance without the common threat Soviet Union. At that time, the keywords were stability of Asia-Pacific region. And this alliance was regarded as a kind of public good to maintain regional stability. And after 9-11 event, the scope of this alliance has been broadened. The area of cooperation has been no longer only within Asia-Pacific region. Now we cooperated with each other in Indian, o Indian Ocean, and uh, the, the Gulf of Aden, and Haiti. Now, I'd like to touch upon the assessment of security environment in this region from the Japanese perspective. It is quite clear that the security environment in this region is getting more and more difficult to cope with for us. Japan is surrounded by three not easy neighbors, i.e. Uh, North Korea, Russia, and China. North Korea is still trying to develop weapons of mass destruction and uh, its delivery means, and their behavior is very unpredictable. Russia is no longer our potential threat, but uh, it seems getting more assertive than before now. China is, of course, a great opportunity and we need to cooperate with each other in various areas. But on the other hand, China has been steadily increasing, increasing defense budget and capability for more than 20 years. And the recent behavior regarding Senkaku Island made Japanese people very concerned about Chinese future. So I think it is fair to say that China is the biggest opportunity 
but at the same time, it is the greatest challenge for the alliance in the next decade. Having said about the, this assessment of the regional security environment, what we should do is quite clear, strengthening and deepening the alliance. I believe in this point, there is no, no, no objection in this room. So today I'd like to go more specific, I, uh, how to strengthen, how to deepen the alliance. Let me give you uh, four categories, four uh, perspectives. First, pursuing fr framework-wise measures. We can network our alliance with uh, the other U.S. alliances, U.S. Korea, U.S. Australia alliances. So we, we already have some trilateral uh, cooperation opportunities, uh, Japan, U.S., Australia, and Japan, U.S., Korea. And I think we can increase this kind of the networking opportunities more. And also strengthening our cooperation in Multilateral framework, such as ARF, is also worth considering. Second, enhancing cooperation in global challenge, international peace activities. We have already had some experience, but I think there will be uh, plenty of rooms to enhance our cooperation in such activities as humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, counterterrorism activities, counter piracy activities, and supporting failed states. Third, exploring possible cooperation in new global challenges. We can cooperate with each other in dealing with new challenges such as space issues, cyberspace threat, climate changes, and maritime security. And the fourth, the last one is what I believe most important in the next decade for the Alliance. It is to make our defense security cooperation more workable and more credible, especially in order to maintain regional order and regional stability. Let me give you some specific examples. Number one, the policy coordination. This includes cross-coordination and cross-consultation in formulating the, our strategic uh, objectives and uh, laws, missions, and capabilities, and policy documents such as the QDR, NPL, and uh, NDPG. And number two, uh, improvement of planning work. I just like to propose three points. One is we should pursue more scenarios, more cases for planning. Second, we should develop seamless response from peacetime to contingency. Third, we should pursue full involvement of related ministries agencies, particularly in Japan. Number three, equipment and technology cooperation. We are now discussing the review of the three principles on arms, arms export. If it is reviewed positively, our cooperation in this area could be enhanced very much. And number four, increasing and strengthening bilateral exercise. Now we are in the process of uh, the, the reviewing national defense program guidelines and in that process, dynamic deterrent is one of the key concepts given the current uh, security environment in this area. And with regard to the Japan-US cooperation, increasing and strengthening and uh, demonstrating bilateral exercise will be the core elements of this dynamic deterrent concept. And number five, information sharing and information security. In order to share more sensitive and more effective information sharing, the appropriate measures of information security is necessary. To conclude my presentations, I'd like to talk about 
deepening the alliance. This is the, as the Mimosan said, this government's key concept regarding alliance. Actually, this is not so, not necessarily easy concept to understand. So when I was asked, what is the deepening the alliance? I sometimes use the three concrete examples based on my experience in this, in this arena. The first example is policy coordination. The depths of bilateral coordination and consultation in the process of the formulating national defense program guidelines or US QDR or NPL are very different if compared with 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Second example is planning work and the bilateral exercise. The degree of involvement and the participation of related ministries and agencies in uh, the planning work and the exercise is very, very different from the 90s based on my, ex my experiences. And the third is co-development of missile defense. While we are maintaining the three principles on arms export, by taking incremental approach, we now finally made it possible to co-develop this strategic equipment, missile defense. And this, this uh, from these three examples of deepening the alliances, I've learned what is necessary for us to deepen alliance. We need trust and confidence between both countries' political leadership, alliance managers, military experts, and the general public. We also need time. It is impossible to deepen alliance in a day or in a year. And finally, we need continued commitment and effort to deepen alliance by rated players. In short, deepening the alliance is a result of accumulation of continued effort and commitment supported by trust and confidence. I think we can do this in the next decades as we did past 50 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Zasan Domaragato. And I think we have some questions here, Ed. But uh, we do. Please. And uh, if you would pass your uh, questions uh, to the ends of the aisles, we have uh, pass mine to volunteers standing by to pick them up, and uh, we'll deliver them to Admiral Fargo. Before we start, let me introduce uh, Lieutenant General Thiessen, who is the Commanding General of our Marine Forces in the Pacific, who is with us today. And he certainly. Uh, uh, he certainly can help answer questions. He's volunteered to do so, and since Admiral Willard is still here, he's uh, at risk also. <laughs> Let me start with the, the first question, which, uh, which is uh, titled The Roadmap. And the question is, in the realignment of the Japan-U.S. alliance, uh, Futema, Futema's closing and relocation is the indispensable first step. When do you see us taking uh, this first step to implement the strategic alliance that we agreed upon. So maybe I'll pass that to Umamoto-san as the, as the first uh, responder, and, and then, uh, then maybe, General, if you could talk to that also, that'd be great. Um, okay. Um, Futema is an issue that we have been grappling with since uh, late 90s. And of course, the, the basic idea is now uh, how to deal with the success story. Because Ftemma was in the middle of nowhere, almost, uh, when it was first built. But because of the economic prosperity, the airfield is now surrounded by building areas. So we have to move it to somewhere uh, where uh, uh, the population is not so densely populated. So we have an agreement 
to relocate it to the northern part of Okinawa. And of course, uh, this is a very important, we believe, is an improvement uh, to the situation. But of course, to the local community, which will, uh, which is supposed to host a new uh, facility, that is an additional, uh, the so-called burden, because of the noise and uh, and so on. So we have to make sure that, that there is a sufficient political support for doing that from both prefecture and the local uh, city. So that's something that we have been working on. Um, and this is also something that uh, uh, touches upon the difficulty of dealing this kind, with this kind of issue in a democratic system. There's a series of local elections and so on. But now that we have a new governor uh, elected, re-elected uh, in Okinawa Prefecture, Prime Minister Khan and all other cabinet ministers are very uh, determined to work with the new governor so that we can get the uh, understanding and support from the local community. This may take a little while, but the, uh, we, we are, and the government is very determined to deepen the communication with the local communities to find out uh, the ways forward. So we hope in the end that we can get the understanding from the local communities because this, unless we implement the agreement, the status quo would have to continue. And then uh, we go back to the starting point because we wanted to change the status quo to improve the situation. So I hope that in the end we can get the understanding from the local community. But we have to be very patient. And uh, this is something that we would like to ask our American friends to be patient. But there is uh, a strong determination on the part of the senior leadership from Prime Minister Khan to many cabinet ministers. Thank you very much. Uh, General? Uh, um, it, it would be difficult for me to add much to what the, the Director General said there. Uh, basically, we have two elements here, right? We have uh, an irrefutable need, a need that everybody has agreed upon, and we have difficulty in getting started and some agreements that have to be made. So we have to sort through that, just like the Director General said. Um, we also, <clears throat> you'll have to forgive me, I've got a cold. Uh, we also have many issues in that, but the gist of the question was when, and the time required to get through these issues to in place this agreement and get some of the details in place is going to be what we have to sort through in the next several months uh, toward that end. But we have to keep, <clears throat> it's easy to lose sight of the strategic requirement, the irrefutable need that we all agree upon with all of the details that start dragging through the press and through the emotions uh, en route uh, to that irrefutable end. There are a lot of details, we have to get through them, but in the end, we need to come up with a solution. Thank you, General. As you can imagine, about three or four of the questions dealt with, uh, with Okinawa and, and the move to Guam. Uh, let me just make one comment before we move on to another topic, and that is that you know, we tend to focus on just the marine movement from Okinawa to, to Guam, uh, but this effort was part of a much larger uh, policy review called the Defense Policy Review Initiative that, that dealt with the footprint and force posture in Japan and actually throughout the, the rest of, the, of East Asia and the, and the Pacific. And of course the effort was to help relieve uh, some of the burden and take a look at areas where there had been encroachment uh, throughout the country uh, to come up with, uh, with a new footprint and posture that would endure for at least the next 20 plus years. So that was the effort. There's other pieces of it, like moving uh, uh, tactical aircraft to Iwakuni into places where their operations would, uh, would contribute to further safety. May, may I make a comment? Sure. Just a comment. Uh, people shift in their seats because there are political issues involved. And by political, I mean local politics as well as national politics 
I'm going into an area carefully with the ambassador, former ambassador who's been involved in both. But uh, while serving in one of the smallest countries in the world, I was very impressed by Prime Minister of Luxembourg who said that politicians always know the right thing to do. What, what, and Governor, I wonder if you'd agree, but what they don't know is how to get elected afterwards. <laughs> and Governor Nakayama, Nakayama has done that, has done that. Yeah, I mean, he was quoted after his re-election as being very much in endorsing the alliance. Thank you, Dan. Uh, the next question deals with North Korea, and it says over 40 years ago, North Korea attacked and captured the USS Pueblo, and U.S. commanders in Japan were unable uh, to utilize assets in Japan. Uh, the question is, what, uh, what changes have been made in the security alliance uh, to deal with today's threats? Mr. Zausan, you want to take a, a shot at that? Take it briefly, and we'll, uh, and we'll work some other people into the discussion. Um, I'm not the, uh, necessarily appropriate to, to talk about the Korea, but uh, I just like to uh, talk about uh, the uh, the current threat and the current the assessment in this region and uh, uh, the uh, in the major perspective. The one is the uh, the currently uh, the warning time is very short, and uh, the uh, in the past there are the uh, deterrent capability was mainly gauged the number of uh, equipment, uh, the size of unit, and the capability of the each equipment. But the currently uh, it's not enough uh, because uh, the not just the size and uh, the uh, uh, the number and uh, uh, the capability, but uh, the currently it's very important to have a operational capability. It's a dynamic the capability is very important. So the, what I said is uh, the to increase and to demonstrate uh, bilateral exercise is very important to show our uh, the uh, deterrent capability. That is, I think, the one of the characteristics in the next decades in this region. Dan, anything to add? Sure. Please, let the Japanese. Well, um, I don't know uh, how to answer about the Pueblo kind of thing, but Korean Peninsula, um, well, we had a first crisis of nuclear uh, program in North Korea in 1993-1994. And at that time, uh, we thought it was a, not only a crisis of Korean Peninsula, but it could potentially be a crisis of the alliance. Because if something happens on the Korean Peninsula, and then U.S. forces uh, get to engage, uh, get engaged in the, uh, uh, military activities. And if Japan cannot provide sufficient support, that will be the end of the alliance. So that prompted a sort of an intensive dialogue between the two governments, which eventually resulted in a joint declaration on security, as well as the review and uh, uh, a revision or of the guidelines, so that uh, we can have more systematic uh, and also legal framework so that we can uh, provide uh, logistic support to the U.S. Uh, uh, activities on the Korean Peninsula. So that's where we are. And that spearheaded the Japanese, uh, subsequent Japanese efforts to uh, improve our legal framework uh, so now we have a, what we call a contingency legislation and so on. But of course, uh, our system is not perfect. So we have to make sure that we continue to make improvements to our, our uh, legal framework as well as the, uh, the, the cooperation uh, in time of contingency between Japan and the U.S. And this is a continuous, uh, continuous effort. And uh, we are committed to continue to do a planning and also exercise and so on. So that in the eventuality, very unfortunate eventuality of something 
and the Korean Peninsula, we will be able to deal with it. And by showing that we are ready, uh, we hope that we can send a clear signal so that we can deter and dissuade a potential adversary from doing that. I really have nothing to add to what DG Yamamoto has said. I might just say that we hear General Ricky's name nearly daily <laughs> in our offices in these efforts. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think we've got time for about two more questions. So let me, let me cover two additional areas that were brought up uh, by our audience. Uh, the next one is, what are the U.S.-Japan uh, interests or concerns for the Philippines? Uh, please discuss the following areas, the economic, military, and quality of life. And this, this question probably could be more broadly addressed to Southeast Asia in general, not just the Philippines. I just like to say one thing. The, uh, the maritime security and uh, the, our common interest is the free navigation of the, uh, the sea lane. And uh, uh, it is also in the case in the South China Sea. So the Philippines is one of the candidates to, to, uh, to, uh, to have a common interest with, the, with their alliance. In that, in that regard, I think it's important. It's, uh, on that question, Admiral Fargo, uh, this has been a very uh, busy year, has it not? And by talking about the Philippines, we back into some of the most important uh, initiatives in U.S. Uh, foreign policy in the past eight months uh, as a part of ASEAN. And ASEAN being, according to the principles we enunciated when we joined the, in the East Asia Summit, ASEAN should be seen as a foundation of all East Asia summit activity. Uh, Philippines being on those sea lines of communication, its prosperity being as dependent as the prosperity of Japan and the U.S. and frankly the other nations that uh, have an interest in the free flow of commerce through the South China Sea uh, is dependent in that area. And uh, got a lot of lawyers on the panels and in the room Fundamentally, we're looking at, uh, among other things, a legal question, an interpretation of an international law. What are the, what are the uh, rights guaranteed uh, by nations to each other and uh, to ensure free commerce? And, and finally, to try our best in working with every nation in the region, and particularly China, let's say it openly, particularly China, to uh, define our respect for international law and our, the importance of that uh, uh, body of water to all of us. Um, maybe I have to be careful, uh, but uh, um, since Japan-US alliance can be said as a public good for the stability of Asia Pacific, so that means that everybody gets benefits out of it. So there's a feeling among some, particularly in Okinawa, which hosts a heavy presence, that those uh, people should have a sort of a, uh, who have a share in the benefits, should have a, fair, uh, a share in sort of a, uh, in the, um, uh, the cost and the risk. So, we used to have a Clark Field in Subic Bay, the U.S. presence in the Philippines. And of course, we know that uh, uh, that is not anymore. But if we have a situation where the U.S. presence can be um, uh, also uh, seen on the Philippines again, I know that there are political difficulties and all these things. But then we have, you have uh, U.S. presence in the Korean Peninsula, Japan, the Philippines, and then Thailand or Singapore and Australia. So this is a challenge. And of course, that's, we, we cannot, uh, and of course, it will be dependent upon the sovereign decision on the part of the Philippines. But we hope one day, that will 
uh, we, we can see that kind of situation again. And I'm sure that that will uh, improve the situation in Okinawa as well. Thank you. I think, let me just add a little additional U.S. perspective to this. Uh, you know, obviously, the United States uh, military and the Pacific Command has a, a very significant ongoing relationship uh, with the Philippines. Uh, the Marines do a, a great deal of training in the Philippines uh, right now, uh, as does the Army. Exercises like Bala Catan. Uh, we have a, uh, we have a counter-terrorist uh, effort going on uh, with the Philippine military that's actually started in around 2002, if I've got my uh, numbers correctly. Uh, as we do with other Southeast Asian nations, uh, we exercise in Thailand. Uh, Cobra Gold is uh, started out as a bilateral exercise. That exercise has moved to, uh, to participation from Singapore and Japan and observers. Uh, certainly the same is true in, uh, in, uh, in Singapore. And, and even a, a country like Indonesia, uh, that of course is hugely important in the future, uh, those military to military relationships have stayed strong uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the conflicts in the Middle East and the mill to mill piece is building, is building there. So uh, I, think, uh, I think those are ongoing efforts. Uh, in terms of, of kind of forced posture and footprint, uh, I referenced the Defense Policy Review Initiative, which was conducted in around 2004. Uh, this, these things are not static. They're ongoing efforts to take a look at, uh, at how we uh, rebalance uh, relationships and, and posture uh, to deal with uh, an evolving security dynamic in the, in the Pacific, and, and that will continue. Uh, last question. Uh, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be the proper security symposium if we didn't talk about China, and the question is, uh, and I'm sure we'll expand the answer is, what is the U.S. expectation uh, to Japan, or I guess you could say with respect to Japan, reflecting China's rapid naval expansion? <laughs> uh, now, one of the things I, I want to play off was, was Mr. Umamoto's comment that he has to be careful. Uh, one of the great things about being the only retired guy up here is I don't have to, so. <laughs> so I'll, I'll let you provide your initial thoughts and then I'll provide uh, some closing comments. Well. <laughs> um, I think the successive uh, prime ministers have said that the China is a big opportunity. And of course, um, but we are concerned about uh, the consecutive, well, uh, the consistent uh, military buildup of China without much transparency. What we would like to hope uh, is that we can have sufficient capabilities to send a clear message to China that if China behaves in accordance with international law and practice, that will be in their national interest. They can get benefit. And if they don't, that will be to the detriment of their national interest. So uh, this is a sort of a delicate message. Uh, this is not the gunboat diplomacy, but how to uh, secure an environment where the rule of law, international rule of law, and that kind of thing prevails. And everybody in the region thinks that a behavior in accordance with that rule is in their own interest. So how to link? <laughs> This and to uh, the specific capabilities is a very uh, sophisticated and difficult task. But uh, basically, what we would like to achieve is that this. Uh, if I could comment, in addition, because uh, I very much agree with everything you just said, D.G. Yumamoto, uh, there is a lack of strategic trust between the United States, Japan, and China. We need to address that. There's nothing inherently 
there's nothing inherent to fear in a nation rising economically. China has benefited tremendously from the peace that has ensued from our alliance and from the U.S. military presence and the U.S. naval forces in the region. So there's nothing inherent to fear in China assuming a greater role in the stage. What we, were, but what we need to get over anxiety is to understand the purpose and to have more trust. And uh, one of the ways I think we can get to that trust is twofold. We must be clear. We must be clear to the Chinese that we do want to create, we want to promote a cooperative relationship with China. But we also have to be clear on what is important to us and what is our bottom line. Because we have to tell people what we want in order for them to accommodate it. And if that causes some friction occasionally, that's okay. The second thing we must do is figure out a way, as you alluded to, to have China and the nations in the region all buy into the notion of this common good, this self-interest, this mutual interest. And that, that is a part of the, the trust question. Yeah, I think just to wrap up that question, uh, Secretary Gates gave a, a great speech in, uh, in Singapore at the Shangri-La Dialogue a number of months ago, I guess it was June of last year, where he, he laid out uh, four principles that I, that I think govern uh, really our policy you know, throughout uh, the region. The first was, of course, uh, free and open commerce, which is self-explanatory. Uh, the second was access to the global commons. And, you know, we used to think of global commons as just being the maritime environment, but today the global commons uh, includes the sea, the air, the space, and even cyberspace. And, of course, uh, all of those are, are key issues uh, today. And, and freedom of navigation is, is a principle that, that we feel is almost akin to freedom of speech because it, it connects directly uh, to the economic prosperity of, of all of these nations. Uh, the third was a point that you just brought up, and that was the, uh, a just international order that emphasizes the rights and responsibilities of nations and fidelity to the rule of law, which is, which is key to making sure the, the playing field is level. And the last was the principle of resolving conflict without the use of force. And so I, I think uh, sticking to those principles will probably provide uh, both of our countries uh, a solid platform to move forward. Uh, let me thank all of, uh, all of our panelists today and, and also the great questions we had from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to do what was And it's a shame I don't get to work with you more. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Fargo and, and the panelists for uh, a wonderful panel. Okay, we're about ready to uh, break for lunch. And... Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to make a, a couple of administrative remarks before we get into that. First of all, let, let, let me apologize on behalf of all the organizers here of not giving you a break in the morning. We're running a little bit late, so we're going to be very conscious of that this afternoon. So uh, we, we hope to give you a break. Uh, second, uh, as a co-sponsor, I would be uh, remiss if I did not uh, uh, thank our sponsors, uh, Lockheed Martin, Mischlegel. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all the others. Uh, that supported us. So we're going to break now. Um, there are eating establishments across the street in the Alamoana Center, uh, which is about five minute walk, and we will meet back here at 1.30, and we will talk about uh, Hawaii, U.S.-Japan economic relations, Hawaii-Japan uh, economic relations. So we will see you at 1.30.